Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, and I am the young adult pastor here at FaithBridge, and it's great to be with you all this morning. Uh, exciting to be up here on what we've referred to as Transition Sunday. And the reason we call it that is because you can see transitions all around us. If you have a friend who is a teacher, you've probably noticed they are transitioning out of their work clothes and into a swimsuit because it's summer vacation. And all the teachers said, amen, right? (laughs) For our seniors, there's a transition happening in your life. It's a new normal that I like to refer to. And the new normal is responsibility. That means that some of you are gonna go off to college, others of you are gonna get a job, and probably all of you are gonna have to learn the value of a dollar because you're gonna be weaned off of your parents' paycheck. So just get ready for that, that's coming. That's the new normal, it's called responsibility. A couple parents clapping for that. They're like, amen, (laughs) keep it going, brother, come on. All of us have seen some transition in the temperature outside. It's that time of year where we kind of go from, man, it is so hot out here, to why do I live in Texas again? Like, goodness gracious. So luckily the rain's kind of been keeping that temperature down for us. But it's a season of transition that we're in. And when Ken asked me to preach this Sunday, I thought, man, I'm not the guy. Because at that time, my life was pretty smooth. It was back in January. There was no transition in my life. I had moved here from Dallas. I'd settled into the young adult pastor role. Things were good. No transition at all. So I don't know if I should be up here. But then April 3rd happened. And as you can see from the pictures, yeah, I got engaged. And now all of a sudden my life is full of transition because I am moving from being a single young man to a married man. And so there's quite a bit of transition happening around me. So I feel really good up here today. I'm in the midst of this. So let's do this thing. (laughs) After April 3rd, a lot of people have kind of been asking me, hey, Sully, what's the best part of being an engaged man? And then others have said, and tell us the worst part. You're an honest guy. Tell us what's the deal. And I said, well, the best part is that I learned that I'm a really attractive guy. (laughs) Hey, you know, I I didn't think that I was ugly growing up, but I certainly didn't think I was a 10 until I got engaged. Because you see, the night that I got engaged, Jill, my fiance, she posted this picture on Facebook, and all of a sudden, there was like 40 or 50 comments from people I've never met. I mean, I've never met them in my life, and they all were saying, congrats, Jill. And I was thinking, they don't know me from Adam. And so they must have just looked at the picture and thought, dang, congrats, Jill. Like, you got yourself. Right? Yeah. So that has been the best part is just learning that I'm a catch. And I feel really good about that. (laughs) But all kidding aside, when people ask me, hey, what's the worst part of being engaged? The worst part is the waiting. You know, I had this mountaintop experience on April 3rd when Jill said yes to, to being my husband one day. And, and then between then, <laughs> oh, y'all are laughing. <laughs> she did say yes, that was a good thing. Uh, but I've been waiting, waiting for the day when we go from the yes to I do. And it's been a couple of months and we've got four more months to wait. And that feels like a really long time to me. After the first service, somebody said, Hey, brother, that's a short engagement, and I apologize to, my, to Jill's mother for making you plan so short, but it feels like a long time. It feels like waiting, and so that's easily the hardest part. And when I was thinking about transitions, transitions in my life, all the major ones have come with this season of waiting. I was thinking back to when I was a senior in high school, and I was graduating and heading off to Texas A&M University. Glad y'all aren't out of those. And uh, I had to wait. I walked across the stage on a Saturday morning and had to wait about three months before I would ever set foot on Texas A&M's campus. But not only that, I had to wait when I got there to get plugged in, to find community, to get into an organization. There was a season of waiting. 
When I accepted this role as the young adult pastor, there was a season of waiting attached to that. I was living in Dallas at the time, and I had to transition out of that role and into this role. And so there was a season of waiting, waiting to move from Dallas. And then even when I got here, adjusting to this new position, doing a completely different job. And so there was a season of waiting. And so all of the transitions in my life have involved waiting. And so this morning, as we're talking about transition, it's Transition Sunday, I want to talk about that season of waiting and what it's like to wait. And the way that I want to do that is by looking at the life of David. And so if you have a Bible this morning, why don't you turn to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16 is where we'll be. The ushers should be coming down the aisle with Bibles. If you need one, just flag them down and they'll get that for you. And as they're doing that and as you're turning, I want to invite those of you who maybe you're sitting in the room and you're thinking, you know, I'm not a senior and I'm not in a season of transition. I think I'll get my afternoon nap started. I want to invite you not to check out. And the reason is because in Ecclesiastes, it tells us that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And I believe that whether it's today or tomorrow, you're going to experience some waiting. In fact, some of you will leave here in just a few moments and go eat lunch, and you're going to wait at a restaurant. Others of you will wait on I-45 tomorrow as you drive into work. Some of you are waiting to transition out of an apartment and into a new home. Some of you are waiting to have kids, and some of you are waiting for your kids to have kids so that you can have grandkids. We are all in seasons of transition. Our life is a constant transition. And so I want to invite all of you to really dig in this morning and just ask the Lord, what would you have for me? Maybe it's not for now, but maybe it's down the road. All of us are going to experience waiting. And so before we dive into this text, I just want to spend a moment praying and just asking the Lord, would you just come and teach us this morning? Teach us through your scripture. So if you'll pray with me for just a second, we'll dive in. Well, God, I'm well aware that there are people in this room who are in a season of waiting right now. There's those of us that are in transition right now. And so this morning, as we come and just gather around your word for a few minutes, God, would you teach them something? Would you use your Holy Spirit through me just to teach what you might have for them this morning? God, I know that in my life, when it's come to seasons of waiting, it's hard to trust you. But God, I know that you're good, and so I just ask that all around this room, you would allow people to just dig in and trust you this morning in a real and fresh way. God, would you prepare the hearts of those who may be entering a season of waiting and help them this morning? But God, we welcome you in this place. We're thankful for Jesus. Thank you for sending him to us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you'll read with me in 1 Samuel 16, we're going to start in verse 1. Here we go. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Skip down to verse 4. It says, When he, meaning Samuel, arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, and he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he had had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. 
Flip over if you do uh, have a Bible to 2 Samuel 5. We're going to read just a couple of verses from there. We'll start in verse 3. The words will be up there if you can't get there in time. And it says this. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. The two passages that we just read in 1 Samuel 16 and in 2 Samuel 5 are the story of David being anointed king of Israel in 1 Samuel 16 and then actually crowned king of Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 5. And what's easy to get lost as you're turning through the Bible, it's just a couple of pages if you flipped. And so you might be thinking, well, not much time has passed between these two events. Maybe it was a year or a couple of months. But the reality is, Scholars would tell us 15 years pass between the time that David is anointed in front of his brothers to the time that he actually becomes king. And so this morning, what I want to do is journey through those 15 years with you and just take a look and see what is it that we can learn from David in this season of waiting. He waited 15 years. So what is it that we can learn? And I think what we can learn from King David is this. While you're waiting, don't stand still. While you're waiting, don't stand still. Several years ago, there were some executives at a local airport who were doing some studies on baggage claim wait times because many complaints were coming in saying, man, I'm waiting forever for my bag. And so they started to do some research and found that the wait time was above industry uh, standard. And so what they did was they just hired on a bunch of staff to reduce the wait time, and it worked. They were able to lower the wait time from well above the industry standard to eight minutes, which is below it, and really not that long of a time. But the complaints increased. Still, they were getting these aggravated customers having to wait for their bags. And so the executives did some some deeper analysis, and what they found was that someone arriving back to the, the gate was walking one minute to baggage claim and then standing for seven minutes waiting on their bag. 88% of their time was them just standing around waiting. And so what the executives did was instead of adding in some extra hands to get that time to five minutes, they creatively just moved the arrival gate way far away (laughs) and had passengers walk an average of six minutes to baggage claim, and they were only standing for two. And you laugh, but the complaints stopped. And so what we know is they make the big bucks for a reason. And what else we learn is that like David, we can see that while waiting, we shouldn't stand still. If you look at the the remainder of 1 Samuel uh, on into 2 Samuel, we can see that David did not stand still during those 15 years. He, He was active and that God was preparing him for what he would have next. God was preparing him through that season for his time of becoming king. The passage in 1 Samuel 16 mentions that David was tending sheep when Samuel arrived that day. And I don't know what you know about tending sheep, but in David's day, the the role of of tending sheep was was left for a servant, maybe a slave. And, And so in this role he is, it's meaningless. It's not a task that a son would do, much less the day that someone is being crowned king in your family, he is left out in the field. And so I was thinking about David this week and thinking, what must it have been like to be in that field, thinking, is my life only this? Have I not been good enough to do something else with my life? My own father has not called me in. And I was thinking about that and just thinking about what was it that David did? Because he didn't wait. I mentioned that. So what did God use during that time to prepare him for his role of king? And I think that we can see from David that in that time, tending sheep, that he learned about the character of God. He learned about the character of God because as many of you know, David is the writer of many of the Psalms that you find in your Bible. He wrote the Psalms. And in fact, one of the most popular Psalms of all time, Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's David, he's in the field and he's looking at his life. He's looking as he is tending sheep and saying, if I take care of these sheep, and care for them so intimately, how much more does my Father in heaven love me and take care of me? How much more does he shepherd me and provide for me? And he's learning that in the field. 
He's learning that while he's tending sheep. He's learning about the character of God. Not only that, but we see David learning some leadership principles while tending sheep. I don't know, again, what you know about tending sheep, but but sheep are kind of worthless animals. Like, they can't do anything for themselves. They're slow. They're kind of pudgy. And like, if an animal came to attack a sheep, its only defense mechanism is kind of to just huddle into a ball and go, bah, like, that's it. That's all it's got. And so they were always getting into a mess and getting into trouble, and David was there to rescue them. And what's interesting is in 1 Samuel 22, we read about the first group of people that David was assigned to lead. And I want you to listen to the descriptor of this group of people. It says that they were distressed, in debt, and discontented. Distressed, in debt, and discontented. And I'm wondering what it must have been like to lead that group. I bet they got into a lot of messy situations I bet oftentimes they weren't able to get themselves out of those situations. And here is David. And I wonder if he didn't stop and just think, man, this is a lot like tending sheep. I know what to do here. I've been prepared for this because I didn't sit still while I was there. I was learning leadership while in the field. Not only that, David is going to transition out of the, the field and into the spotlight. We see in 1 Samuel 17 that David kills Goliath. It's one of the greatest military victories for the history of the Israelites. And in this moment, David becomes super popular. In fact, a song was written about him, and it goes like this. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. David is popular. He's one of the most popular guys in all the land. And I was thinking, if I knew that I had been anointed king, and knew that I would be taking this position from Saul, I think this is the moment that I would choose like the moment where you're the most popular you could be, like your approval rating is through the roof right now. Now is the time. But that doesn't happen. In fact, just the opposite. God uses Saul to chase David out of the spotlight and into a cave. Why did he do that? Why would God do that? I think it's because in that moment, God wanted to reveal David's heart. He wanted to move him to this cave and see, is David with me? Does he trust me? Does he trust my plan for his life? Or is he going to go seek the glory and the fame from those men? Does he trust me? He was revealing David's heart. And what we see in that cave, many of you know this, that David was labeled a man after God's own heart. And so what we know is that in that cave, his heart was revealed. And it's that he trusted God, that he would seek him above all else. And I was thinking about that this week, that truth that God reveals the state of our heart while we're waiting, that he'll reveal our hearts. And I learned that just last week. You see, I ordered some new desks for my office. And so I asked one of my coworkers to come help me because there was an option to like pay somebody 40 bucks or do it yourself. Uh, And I'm saving for a honeymoon right now. And so I obviously chose the do it yourself method. And so I invited this coworker to come help me. And I'll just admit right now, My handy skills are about like the Texas Longhorn football team last year. Not very good. And uh, I'm an Aggie. Sorry, I had to. Sorry about that, Longhorns. I do love you dearly. I really do. And so I began to build this desk, and it had 29 steps to it. And most of them read something like this. Attach part B with part X2 with screws YY. I mean, just the weirdest steps you've ever seen. And so I was watching my coworker try and decipher this manual. And we had been like three hours into desk one. So this is quite the project and I am fed up. I'm tired of waiting. And so in that moment, I decided to snatch the manual out of his hand. Like I was Tim, the tool man, Taylor or whatever. And I'm looking at it. And an hour later, under the Michael Sullivan regime, we finished that desk with the drawers on backwards. (laughs) Awesome moment. But what I learned from building that desk is that truth, that while you're waiting, God reveals your heart. Because even in that short season of waiting, God was revealing to me, Michael, you still need to grow in patience. You need to grow in compassion and kindness and joy. Here this guy is helping you build this desk and you're a jerk. He was teaching me in that moment. And I'm just wondering today, as we're talking about waiting in the season of transition, what is it that God would have for you this morning? What is it that he might want to teach you 
this morning. For some of you, maybe it's the reminder that while you wait, while you move in and out of seasons of transition, you need to continually pursue getting to know the Lord's character, getting to know who he is. And if that's you, I've got some good news. This is the perfect time to be desiring that because right now on this campus and in the Woodlands, we have plenty of opportunities starting this summer for you to know the Lord. In fact, if you are a senior in high school or maybe you're a college student that's come home or maybe just a young adult in this room, I'm gonna make an unashamed plug. Come to Young Adults. We start this Thursday night at eight o'clock and we'd be glad to have you. We've got new small groups starting up. This is the perfect time to join community and to learn about the character of God. Some of you adults in this room, there are grow groups starting summer studies. And again, this is the perfect moment to engage with those groups, to get into community and to start learning about the character of God. They mentioned a three-week evangelism course. It's gonna be right here on the Klein campus. There's all kinds of opportunities for you to continue to get to know the Lord in this season of transition, in this season of waiting. And I know as we enter the summer, many of you might be thinking, man, I'm just too busy. You know, my kids are going to be at the swimming pool and we're going to be on vacation. And so I'm going to be in and out and maybe this isn't the time. I'm here to tell you it is. Whether you're going to be in and out or not, continue to engage and get to know the heart of the Lord. Maybe that's what he has for you this morning. Others of you, As I mentioned David being in the field, you're like, oh yeah, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to tend sheep. I know what it's like to be doing a meaningless task. Or I'm sitting at a job that this is not the job I'm planning to be at my whole life and it feels very meaningless. And maybe what you need to hear this morning more than anything else is to look around. Look around and see how is it that God might want to prepare you while you're tending sheep. I was reminded of this thinking back to in college. Uh, my job was to write sports articles for Texas a and M school paper, the battalion. And as you might guess, the sport that everyone wants to cover is football. And the first few articles that I got assigned were swimming, cross country, and tennis. And I played tennis for 10 years, and I can just tell you that not many of those articles arrive on the front page of the battalion, okay? In fact, many of them don't even make the paper, they make online, and I was thinking, I think my grandmother was the only one that ever read those articles, and maybe not even her. And it's interesting, I can remember thinking during that time, and this is so meaningless. Like, I should try and just like write a phrase in the middle of the article that makes no sense to see, does anybody even pick up on it? Like, no one's looking at my work. This is meaningless. But what's interesting is that it was a tennis article that I wrote It was discovered by the Big12Sports.com editor, and he asked me to publish a few more articles for them. And when I was in my interview for Deloitte, the company I worked for before coming here, the thing the interviewer noticed was the fact that I had published those articles for Big 12 Sports, and that's what landed me the job. And I was thinking about how this small task that I was doing, this small thing, writing these tennis articles, it really wasn't a big deal. No one was watching it. I think that what God wanted to teach me through that experience was to be faithful in the small things, the things that no one's looking at. And it's interesting, as I've moved into ministry, I can see where learning that lesson back then has continued to apply here. I was thinking how meaningful it is sometimes just to send a text message to encourage a young adult or to spend a little extra time in prayer. It's interesting how those things, those small things that no one sees make all the difference. And so for some of you, maybe you are tending sheep. You're in the field, and I just want to encourage you to look around. What is it that God might have for you right now in this season of waiting? Not to check out, not to just be thinking totally about the next thing, but to be thinking, Lord, how can you use me right where I am? You've put me here for such a time as this. How can you use me? The last group of you, maybe what you need to hear from the Lord this morning is that he wants to reveal some things in your heart during this waiting season. Maybe you're like me and he's trying to work out that compassion and joy and patience. Or maybe you're like David and he's put you in this cave and what he wants to see is, do you trust me? When you're in a season of waiting, will you trust me? Or will you try to execute your own will? Maybe that's what the Lord has for you this morning. To close, I just want to encourage all of you. I was thinking back on on my seasons of waiting and in each of those moments, I can see that the Lord was revealing things in my heart. 
I can see where he grew my character in the process. I can certainly see all of these things now. But in the moment, I want you to hear me say very clearly this morning, waiting is not easy. Waiting is difficult. Waiting can be painful. And I want you to hear that that's okay. If you enter this room and that's how you feel, that's okay. In fact, we know this because of David. In Psalm 42, David writes this. He says, my tears have been my food day and night. Why, my soul, are you downcast? He's sitting in the middle of that cave in that 15 years of waiting, and he's saying, why am I so downcast? Lord, where are you? What are you doing in this time? Are you doing anything at all? And he's sitting there doing that. And so if that's you, it's okay to be there. It's okay to cry out to the Lord and be honest about how you feel. But here's what's not okay. It's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to stay there. You see, like David, we have a God, a God that truly loves us, who's trustworthy, he's good, and he desires good things for you. And so in Psalm 42, we don't see David stop with, why are you downcast, oh my soul? We see him move on and he says this, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Put your hope in God. And you know what's interesting about that? In Psalm 42, David says that twice. Two times in Psalm 42, we're gonna see David say, put your hope in God. And I think the reason that he did that is because waiting is difficult. And when you're waiting, there's gonna be days when it's easy and there's gonna be days when it's really hard. There's gonna be days when you're just gonna have to cry out and say, soul, put your hope in God. Put your hope there and command yourself, remind yourself of that truth to put your hope in God. And the good news for us is that there was another king that came behind King David, and that's King Jesus. And like David, he had to wait for 30 years, the Bible tells us, to start his ministry. And he knows what it's like to be in a season of waiting. He knows the difficulty that comes with it. And that's why in Hebrews 4 it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so this morning as we close, I wanna invite you to go to the throne of grace with confidence. Jesus sits there and he knows what it's like to wait. And so for each of you that are in this season, he knows. And so I wanna invite you as we close up just to bow your head and we're just gonna ask the Lord, maybe some of you need to cry out like David and just confess, man, I'm downcast. This season of waiting is difficult. And then what I want you to do is just remind yourself to put your hope in God, to put your hope in God this morning. So why don't you pray with me? Well, God, I know firsthand that seasons of transition and season of waiting can be difficult. And Lord, I just want to pray a blessing over this room and just pray and ask your favor that as they are waiting, Lord, you would just speak to each one of them. God, would you maybe reveal even this morning what you have for them? Maybe for some of them, it's just that reminder to continue to pursue your character, to continue to get to know you more. For others, maybe it's that you're revealing some things in them that you want to work out in this season, some pride or some selfishness or whatever it may be. But God, I pray that you would just use these seasons of waiting. God, you don't use them in vain. But Lord, I just want to invite people to put their hope in you this morning. I don't know what your week's been like, and so I just want to give you a moment in the stillness of this room just to talk to the Lord to confess if, you're, if your soul is downcast or to just re-surrender and say, Lord, I put my hope in you. I trust you more than anything else. So why don't you do that this morning? Just in the quietness of this room, take a minute to pray.
But God, you are worthy of praise. Lord, I pray that these next few minutes as we do close in worship, God, that you would just allow us to yet praise you for being our Savior and our God. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with young adult pastor Michael Sullivan, who just delivered a message called Don't Stand Still. Today we graduated and celebrated our seniors, and what a great message for this transition that they're going to be moving into and really applies to all of us um, as we all find different transitions. And you are certainly talked a lot about your transition. And so um, what other thoughts did you have on that transition today that you wanted to talk about? Well, the first thing in the 11 o'clock service, I need to clarify that Jill is going to be my wife. Apparently, I said that she was going to be my husband. Uh, and I learned after the service that that runs in the family, that my mom, whenever she was going through her wedding vows, said that she, Cindy, instead of saying, I, Cindy, take the mic, she said, I, the mic, or I, Mike, take the Cindy. So runs in the family to mess these things up. So <laughs> just wanted to clarify okay, that. Okay, good. Well, now that we have that clear, um, what a great message today. And I think that being in a waiting period or being in a transition period, God can really use that. And mm -hmm. he reveals a lot of things to us. Um, you talked about three today, um, learning about the character of God, looking for how he might be preparing you, and then how God can reveal things in your heart. But what other ways can God use waiting times as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was talking to Dylan, our executive pastor, before I talked, and we were just talking about how, with the example I gave about people waiting on their baggage uh, and, and the complaints that were in there, we were saying, I wonder how many of those people weren't standing still. Like how many of them would have complained if they had, instead of going and standing at the baggage claim, went and got a toy for their child or struck up a conversation with the person next to them and probably none of them. And so I think oftentimes we don't like waiting, but we don't look around and see what God has for mm -hmm. us right where we are. And so mm -hmm. maybe it's just simply looking around your office and thinking about who is it that God might want me to share the gospel with or to invite to church or just to engage in a conversation in a small way or when you're waiting to move to another city, not to just check out, but to continue to engage with your neighbors and help them foster into community as well. So there's opportunities all around us if we just look around and and not so much focus on the end like as you're standing there at baggage claim waiting for your bags when that's your only focus that's all you can think about I mean I think about for me I'm heading to get married you know that's or waiting what I'm waiting on and if I only focus on that one day I lose so much the beauty mm -hmm. of the process to continue to get to know Jill uh, to build into what is going to be our relationship it's more than just that day and I think so many times we focus on the one moment and forget about the process. So that's what I would encourage people to continue to focus on what opportunities are around me and focus on the process versus the actual event or whatever it is you're waiting for. That's great. And as you talked a little bit about David and things in his heart and how God was preparing him, um, just came to mind just thinking about how important prayer is mm -hmm. in the waiting. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Absolutely. And I think David is a great example of that because we know that he spent all that time in the field and he learned to hear the Lord's voice mm -hmm. over and over again through his prayer, through him calling out to God. We see that time and time again in the Psalms. He learned to know the Lord's voice and what the Lord's will was for him. So much so that I mentioned the cave. We know that Saul, the king, was chasing David, trying to kill him and stumbled into the cave where David was. And David was a mighty warrior. He mm. took down Goliath. And so he could have nailed him right there and, and taken the kingdom. But David listened to the voice of the Lord that said, no, that's not the way that you're gonna take this. You're gonna wait for my timing and wait for me to deliver you the kingdom whenever I decide that is to be. And so he knew the voice of the Lord mm. from the previous time. So especially in this season of waiting, to continue to be in prayer and to ask the Lord to make it so clear the opportunity that comes to you. I think about, for me, when I came to FaithBridge, I was having a lot of success at Deloitte. I was scheduled to be promoted, 
uh, and to come here was a big step. And really, I was used to hearing the voice of the Lord and, and hearing from Him from studying Scripture all the years previously that allowed me to know when this opportunity came, yes, this is what is next. This is lining up with His heart. And so I think, yes, prayer is huge. And just to be constantly in community who can speak into your life in these seasons and direct you back to the Lord, I think all of those things are huge uh, in seasons of waiting. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your message today. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.